And joining us now to talk markets uh, as we recap Monday's market trade session. Uh, some interesting things of note coming back from the holiday weekend and a holiday shortened trading week. Here to dive into it with us, our good friend John Heinberg, Total Farm Marketing, joins us as we are broadcasting on the road outside Indianapolis here on the show today. John joins us from his uh, his home office in Wisconsin. John, hope you had a good holiday uh, coming back here this week. Kind of some interesting moves in this grain market to start the week. Beans up sharply, wheat down sharply, corn kind of just caught in the middle. Um I don't know. I, I, we got the low volume trade last week and then come back in here on Monday. A few different news items, China lockdowns and protests, et cetera. That seemed to be maybe the one news item I saw on the trade. What are your thoughts uh, broadly in the grains as we start? Yeah, at least that was the overnight trigger into the weakness that we had. You know, the markets were down fairly strong on the overnight double digits, lower in beans and wheat. Corn was down a handful of cents. Big drop in crude oil again because of those demand concerns regarding what's going on in China. Again, if anything that you know slows down that demand, that's going to put pressure on crude oil. But you know, as the day went by today, again, let's uh, focus maybe on that crude oil market because that, that seems to be a bit of a trigger market right now. Again, at least overall, given where prices are, you know, prices put to new lows this morning, breaking through the seventy-four dollar barrel handle. Then we just got a late buzz headline that at the next OPEC plus meeting, they're going to be talking about production cuts and boy, prices just ripped right back to the upside, putting in another kind of a key low like we put in here last week. So we'll have to see if, you know, maybe we're at that point now where equilibrium kicks in. Plus, I know our government has talked about picking up crude oil for the reserves below $75. So that's a you know a natural buying point. Maybe they got something going today. So we'll have to see. That seemed to be the trigger that brought that you know, that, that corn market back off the lows added some strength to the bean market, which was holding in there pretty well anyway. Uh, the biggest thing I'm watching in beans right now, we have this new Argentina talk about the possibility or they're going to lower their peso or change that peso rate so they get more export sales. But they got weather issues right now. We're probably going to see some reduction in that bean crop. Now, if they're moving beans on the export front, what are they going to have for soybean meal for crush? For export there, we had great strength in the soybean meal market. And then when that oil market turned around, when the crude oil market came back, bean oil came flying back. And that's what pushed beans to finish where they did today. Well, with crude oil, John, I, I just find this market very interesting. We've lost a lot the last 10 to 14 days. Maybe finding a chance to firm here. Maybe crude, you know, finds its new range in this $75, $80 window. What does that speak to for commodities through the end of the year? It, uh, we've been watching crude all year long, and it feels like it's kind of the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. It's a, it's a driver in these markets, and it's making things um, even more volatile, it feels like, John. Uh, very much so. You know, I mean, again, a lot of these indexes and commodity indexes are based on, you know, the a full basket, but they're weighted heavily with crude oil. So that one can be the one that can turn that things around very, very quickly, uh, either direction based on how it acts. And, you know, it's also a barometer, you know, where are we at in terms of consumption of commodities in general? And, and realistically, you know, the crude oil supplies, we're worried about Russian price caps coming in play. So maybe we saw some heavy buying coming into that window to secure things in case that supply gets limited. So that might be some of the pressure we've seen a little bit, too, is that those supplies are in hand. So nobody really needs demand right now. Uh, but we'll have to watch. But now if China gets things figured out with the COVID situation, if the protests do actually cause some type of change and opens up the demand window, crude oil is going to be pretty underpriced here. Uh, which could be a very interesting move. So, you know, as producers, you're looking at fuel costs for the spring. You know, we, we got new lows in. So that's probably a window you want to make sure you're thinking about some of those things. There are some different tools that we can use, too, uh, through for purchasing you know, oil and, and getting some coverage on some fuel costs. Uh, so those options are out there for producers as well. So, you know, it, it's going to be a volatile market. There's a lot of forecasts out there for crude oil to really be strong in the spring. I know when you look at call buying versus put buying in the crude, crude oil market. It's heavy on the call side right now. That means this market's setting itself up for an upward revision uh, in terms of price. And this might be our an area here. We're at our lows. John, uh, the China front, uh, real briefly, a little bit more. I, I know that uh, you would think that hearing the issues with demand and the protests and more in China, the rare protests we're seeing over there, you would think that would be bearish soybeans, especially 
and then also throw on top the Argentina news with the pesos for soybeans program reinstated through the end of the year. You'd think those would be bearish beans, but it just didn't seem that way. It seemed like crude oil took uh, kind of took precedent over those two stories on Monday, John. It did to one in one turn. But the other thing we got to take a look at here, where are we at with crush margins right now? So we've been crushed here in the United States, still trying for January on the futures charts, straight about 250 a bushel, still very profitable for the crushers. We get an export inspections number today, a little over 2 million metric tons. So you've got some direct competition being set up between the domestic end user trying to lock in supplies and the exporters trying to get things overseas to to China, most likely in this window. And that's really what's helping the cash market here. And that's very noticeable in the spreads in the market. Look at the spreads today, January and March versus next year. You know, you're seeing six, five, six, seven cent jumps in those spreads today with the buying on that front end of the market, trying to secure those supplies that of what is a tight harvesting crop. So that's something this market's trying to tell us here a little bit that, hey, there's some demand here in the front end. We don't have the bushels to compete. And uh, that's going to keep this market pretty well supported. Now, today's close. We rallied the January contract to 1460 area. We've challenged this area now. This is the top of our trend line. This is the top of the range. All those fun little expressions that we use. You know, we're over a 200-day moving average. The last four or five times we've been here, we failed and came back the next day. So this is probably a window you should have maybe sold a few cash beans today. And if this market breaks out to the upside, make sure you're looking at those tools. If it breaks out, we got some room to run uh, here. So this could be a pretty key, interesting uh, couple of days here. See if this bean market truly wants to get going, or are we just going to come back down to the bottom of the range, which is about 40 cents down? We had December options expiration last week. We have uh, first notice day delivery coming up here this week. Uh, how much is that playing into any of the market moves? Uh, it just feels like from what I saw, not many people really in any of these December contracts at this point. We've kind of rolled a lot of it to the March contracts, John. Very much so. I mean, yeah, obviously we, it does cause a little bit of riffle in terms of some of the volatility. Obviously last week, probably more with the options expiration. You know, with the shortened holiday week, people are getting moving quickly because you just don't know what this market's going to do. And again, the talk about the spreads, all of a sudden that December, March spread kind of worked, flattened out pretty fast and gave some opportunity for people to roll. Uh, so I think, like you said, most people probably out of that December, there's still a few that probably need to work it out here in the next day or so. So that'll bring some pressure in one way or another to this market, at least maybe on that front month contracts and how that trickles through. Options expiration, maybe that was some of the strength that we saw going into the end of the week as, again, the market likes to flow to where those open interests are in terms of those option strikes. And that was up in that 670, 680 area. And that just kind of drug us right up there. So so with that being said, you know, we kind of got to get through these couple of days and then we can sit down and focus. Now, seasonality typically says, you know, grain markets, corn and wheat, corn and soybean, excuse me, stay fairly firm until the Christmas window. Uh, the money flow is what I'm going to be curious to see. What's the what's the commitment of traders say today? They've really shaved a lot of corn contracts out here. So it gives them some room if we get the right news or we get the right technical move that the funds could bring some money flow back into the corn market. You know, they're going to be down probably 100,000 plus contracts off the commitment of traders off the most recent high. And that gives them some money flow in. Now, the other concerning side is if they got the reason to keep pushing and liquidating long positions, they got the path at least going to that direction. But uh, just like the way things acted today, I consider that today would be a fairly good win to be mixed and just marginally you know, traded today, given where the weakness was last night, given the weakness in that wheat market. For corn to hold in here around 670 on March, I thought was a pretty good accomplishment on a pretty negative tone to start the day. You brought up wheat. I want to go there. Uh, really a rough day. Chicago, KC wheat just kind of took it out the chin. Spring wheat was down a bit as well. I feel like seasonally wheat can tend to work a little bit lower here at the beginning of December. What are your thoughts in this wheat market, though, just seeing the price action on Monday and just kind of the doggish day that we had? Yeah, disappointing day today again, right from the get go. And we did work ourselves off the lows. Feels like March 780 is going to may hold us here. We'll have to watch tomorrow. You know, again, the long term trend lines underneath the charts, we're kind of down there poking at them. You know, so maybe we're getting to the point where we're cheap enough. The funds continue to grow a short position in that Chicago wheat contract, uh, which is pretty interesting to see that the things do turn on the geopolitical front. They're going to be on the wrong side very, very quickly, and that could lead to some explosiveness. So we'll have to see if we get that trigger. 
right now it's just a combination of things. Our demand is just not there where we need it to be. We did have some weather, maybe come across some of the Southern Plains to help out some areas in that regard over the weekend. You know, so that put some selling pressure into the market at the end of last week and, and carrying over into the day. That Russian wheat crop is still large and still under uh, underpriced compared to the rest of the world. So we're still expensive there. And then we get export inspections today. We're just nothing uh, to jump up and down about in that regard. You know, so there's just still enough headwinds over that wheat market to probably prevent things from going. But at the same time, are we starting to get to a value when we start talking 780 on the week, given the tight global supply picture? We do have issues in Argentina. You do have issues in Australia. You know, when does that maybe start coming together? You know, and even the U.S. crop will get crop ratings today, but they're still going to be poor uh, in terms of that winter wheat crop. So, you know, it was encouraging to watch spring wheat a little bit today. It tried to run positive for a while, and maybe that could be one of the heavy lifters. So we'll have to kind of watch what happens with some of those other markets. You know, wheat looks kind of like negative on the chart, but sometimes when things look the most negative, that's when that opportunity to maybe step in and own it might start becoming in front of us here. John Heinberg, Total Farm Marketing, is our guest today on the show. John, livestock trade, hog market was rough on Monday. I feel like that was maybe tied to the China issues and crude oil moving off its lows, maybe a combo of the two. What's your thoughts in that hog market first off? You know, the hog market just continues to struggle. Maybe we're getting out of our skis a little bit here again. We crossed under some key technical moving averages. I look at that February contract, 200-day, 100-day. Those are kind of sell triggers. We blew through those today, and that just saw, sent the technical traders into the market, taking some length out. You know, again, the Chinese factor in terms of what's going on with COVID, you know, lack of demand maybe comes into play, even though last week's hog export sales numbers were really, really strong at 40,000 plus. And then good shipment week as well. So, you know, it just turned into a bit of a technical wash today. I think as prices continue to roll over that December contract, we're struggling on the retail front. We're struggling in the cash market. Really not a whole lot of reasons to own things here, uh, at least in that regard. And that's kind of maybe got reflected today. Still look at that index. We're still trading at, you know, we were at a you know, pretty good, pretty good discount. Now it's a, you know, premium to a discount, excuse me. You know, so maybe that'll put some breaks on that December contract. One thing I watched last week was the movement in the spread between December and February. That needed some correction. So we saw that happen today as well. Uh, so it might be just kind of one of those windows where just the technical trade just outweighed everything that could have been positive in terms of that market. Cattle markets held up all right on Monday, um, at least compared to the hog market anyway. Uh, for the most part, I thought cattle last week's export sales were okay. Uh, we got some cash trade in the feedlots. Looking this week to see if we can get some more. Uh, what's your thoughts in this cattle market? You know, I we hear the stories about how credit cards are getting maxed out and what could happen to retail demand and things like that and just income around the holidays. Uh, you know, wonder what that could do for demand here domestically and how that could factor into the market as well. What's your what's your take on that and just cattle in general, John? A lot of moving pieces, you know, right now in the cattle market, equity markets pushing 450 down today, too. So that that just kind of puts that trigger in there. Uh, we'll have to watch what happens with crude oil prices. If they do find a bottom, start climbing higher, that puts pressure on the consumer. Those things still weigh. You know, real, realistically, though, to me, this turned into a seasonal trade. You know, typically you come in here the day or two after Thanksgiving. If you are a seller in the cattle market, hold it into the first part of December, you're a winner. Uh, and that seems to be what's started happening last week on Wednesday. You know, the cattle market didn't even blink when we came in with stronger cash trade last week. And we just continued to sell through good news. You know, the cattle numbers obviously are tight. So to me, any weakness here may still set up longer term strength for us and opportunities to, you know, if you move some cattle into these high prices out in the spring, great chance to get some price flexibility to the upside with some call strategies or reown them on the board, something along those lines. You know, the one sign of this that is not going away is still that demand is still fairly good out there. I mean, it is actually very good here for U.S. beef as well as the international side of things. And if we get some pullback in price, I think that's going to show it, show itself again and be supportive. But again, this is one of those windows for about a couple of weeks here. This market likes to sell off. So we're seeing if that seasonal trend holds. Like I said, it started on Wednesday last week. Seems like it wants to still hold in this window. But then that window turns very quickly into a buy seasonal as we get into that first part of December, owning those springtime cattle, watching them into a 
to a winter high that usually kicks in, you know, late January, 1st of February. So again, might be an opportunity to be a buyer into this market. We'll have to watch because the supply side is not going anywhere. And the funds kind of maybe pushed out some length and wanted to take a little money off the table just because of that seasonal window. We've watched a lot of seasonal trade really play out all year in these commodity markets and this may be another indication of that type of trade. Dairy market, John, looked like fairly mixed activity there on Monday. What's your take in this dairy market? Yeah, dairy market's a little bit concerning to me right now just because that split between blocks and barrels and you know, over the last couple of days, we've seen the block price come down to try to meet barrels. That usually gives us weakness. Now, what could be a little bit supportive is the demand tone that's out there on the, in terms of national international production. You see strong production drops in Australia, New Zealand. You know, those are competing pounds of milk out there as competing product. That's kind of helped move shift some energy to the U.S. side for some export demand. But just don't like the action of cheese prices going into the end of the year. Our milk production was up again last month. You know, that just kind of tells us that maybe we got a little bit of a backup of supplies here. Charts don't look very friendly, especially after the turn here off the most recent highs. So we'll see if $20 can hold December in check. It did at least so far today. Uh, but again, looks like maybe a bit of a slippery slope, especially if we don't start seeing some improvement in terms of those cheese prices. You know, with blocks at 212 and then you got barrels at $1.82. You know, which price meets which. If blocks come to meet barrels, that means milk price is probably coming down. John, great stuff as always. Uh, before we run out of time, just some some general risk management thoughts, maybe some reiterating of, of what you mentioned today. But we're kind of getting that time frame here, wrapping up the year. We're balancing books, tax season, et cetera. Farmers decide if they need to move some grain before the end of the year, maybe, or cattle or hogs, whatever the case is. Uh, any general risk management thoughts, anything changing in your mindset heading to December? I mean, really nothing has. I mean, it's all about price flexibility. I still think that's going to be the key for producers. You just don't want to lock something in and, and watch the market take off one way or another. You know, you want to make sure you keep some protection underneath. But there's still a lot of headlines that could come together that can push prices higher. You know, in the grain side, I know we got great value out there, but if you go ahead and move some beans off here, you know, take advantage of a 20 cent rally and sell old crop beans out of the bin here, you know, well, what if South America does turn dry for the second half of the growing season? What if we stay dry according to some of our drought monitor maps and we don't have production like we need for next year? You know, this, this market's got volatility in it. But again, at the same time, you don't want to be foolish and not take advantage of good price. So that's where that price flexibility comes in. Find a way to build floors, keep price of flexibility open to the upside. So somehow you're still in this market. You know, the, the U.S. producer is actually fairly lucky in that regard that there are tools available for them to, you know, sell things, lock in gains, lock in profitability, but still keep their toe in the market in case prices take off. Well, John, a producers need some advice. Want to reach out to you and the team there at Total Farm Marketing. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure, love to chat with them anytime. Give me a call, 800-334-9779. Shoot me an email at johnh at totalfarmmarketing.com. Don't forget about our website, totalfarmmarketing.com. Like I always say, it doesn't cost anything to pick up the phone and ask questions. Always a pleasure to chat with you, sir. With that, John Heinberg, Total Farm Marketing, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. Sounds good. Have a great week. And that's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.